So we're just going to wait a few more minutes to make sure more people have logged on. Yeah. Hi, Naomi. Feel free to say hi in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. We'd love to know where you're all coming from this evening. Hi, Eve. Ah, North Shropshire. It's always fun when someone logs in from Australia or somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just going to wait a few more minutes to get started. Hi, Lindsay, a local Stockport person. Just going to wait till half past. Right. Hello everyone and welcome to our wildlife friendly gardening webinar. My name is Rachel Nellis and I work for Cheshire Wildlife Trust. I'll be hosting the webinar this evening but I'll be passing on uh, to Ken shortly for him to begin the talk. So we're just going to wait a few more minutes before we properly start to give people a chance to log on. Uh, in the meantime, I'll tell you a little bit about Cheshire Wildlife Trust's new urban project, Wild Stockport. So Wild Stockport is an initiative run by Cheshire Wildlife Trust to help bring wildlife back to Stockport by encouraging communities to make space for nature where they live. Our focus for the year is to work with communities, schools and businesses to bring awareness of and improve habitats for hedgehogs, swifts, and pollinating insects, as these unfortunately are all facing a decline. So we are doing this through a number of free community events, workshops, activities, and talks like the one we are hosting this evening. If you have any questions during the talk, please pop these in the Q&A box and we will answer these at the end of the webinar. Right, so as it's half past seven now, um, I will pass over to Ken, Ken, who will introduce himself and begin the Wildlife Friendly Gardening Talk. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, well, uh, good evening all. Um, I'm Ken Thompson. I'm plant ecologist by uh, training, uh, but now retired. Um, I've done a lot of research on wildlife in gardens, written books on wildlife gardening, 
um, and uh, regularly talk on the subject and on other gardening topics. So as the, as the title of the talk says, Wildlife Gardening's Big Questions Answered, I hope we will answer your big wildlife gardening questions over the next uh, half an hour, three quarters an hour or so. Um, if not, you can always, if any of them remain unanswered, you can always, you can always ask them via the Q&A. Before we start though, a bit of context. Um, until about 50 years ago, we didn't, we really didn't know anything about wildlife in gardens. Um, basically, no one had ever bothered to look. And so in that, in that absence of information, in that kind of vacuum, there was quite a prevalent belief that gardens were fairly useless for wildlife, actually, that they were just too, um, well, too, I don't know, too small, too, uh, too alien, too tidy, too unnatural um, to be any use for wildlife. And so we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude to this lady, Jennifer Owen, um, because she decided um, 50 years ago in 1972 in fact to decide she decided to start catching identifying counting as much of the wildlife in her Leicester garden as she possibly could um, and eventually much later she received a medal and here she is with the with the medal from the Royal Horticultural Society for her work and basically she tried to catch and identify all the wildlife in her garden that she could and after she'd been doing that for 30 years uh, 15 years she wrote this book the ecology of a garden the first 15 years and after she'd been doing it for another 15 years um, which is when she finally stopped she wrote this book wildlife of a garden a 30-year study and these two books, um, in my opinion, are the best books about garden wildlife that have ever been written and probably ever will be written. Um, they're just absolutely brilliant. And what Jennifer Owen found was that in her garden, over the whole 30 year period, these are the numbers of species that she recorded in her garden at least once um, 54 species of birds seven different mammals three amphibians 1997 species of insects and 138 other miscellaneous invertebrates um, spiders snails, wood lice, um, and so on. So the interesting thing, well, there are, there are, there are a whole bunch of interesting things about these numbers, actually. Um, one of them is that it's immediately obvious that the biodiversity of gardens, the wildlife of gardens, the value for, of wildlife in gardens resides almost entirely in these things down here, these small things, insects and other invertebrates. They vastly outnumber the larger inhabitants of gardens in terms of numbers of species and even more in terms of numbers of individuals. There's nothing unusual about gardens in that respect. Um, gardens are just a reflection of the rest of the world. Um, in that respect. The other slightly less obvious thing about these numbers is that these numbers along the top here, birds, mammals and amphibians, those lists are reasonably complete. 
In other words, if Jennifer Owen had carried on monitoring the wildlife in her garden for another 30 years, um, she might have found one or two more birds. She might. She probably wouldn't have found any more mammals or amphibians. So this list is basically complete. You're not going to add much to this list. This list, on the other hand, down here, and especially this one, numbers of insects, is very incomplete. Um, we know it's very incomplete because Jennifer Owen simply was not able to attempt to identify all the insects um, that, that lived in her garden. Um, she wasn't able to catch all of them. And even among the ones she did catch, she wasn't able to identify all of them because there just aren't enough hours in the day. Um, reasonable extrapolation from what she did attempt to identify suggests that this number is far too small and that over the whole 30 year period there may well have been 10,000 insects, insect species or maybe even more um, in, her, in her garden in Leicester. So I make no apology uh, later on in this talk when I talk about biodiversity of gardens. I talk very largely about these things down here because they're just far more numerous and frankly far more important uh, than these larger things up here, even if most of the time uh, you tend not to notice most of them. And the final point I'd make about these numbers, about this, uh, these numbers is that Whatever you think about these guys down here, whether you are not really very fond of all these creepy crawlies, frankly, you have to have them because these guys up here mostly eat these down here. And therefore, if you want lots of larger animals in your garden, you have to have all these smaller animals um, for them to eat. Just one example here of what uh, was what was found in Jennifer Owen's garden, at least 533 species of parasitoid wasps in Jennifer Owen's garden. Um, I say at least because for various reasons we know there must have been more than that, but that's just the number that were actually identified. Um, so parasitoid wasps, if you don't know them, these are insects that um, lay their eggs in the inside or on other insects or other invertebrates or in their larvae or in their eggs and they develop in there and then kill the kill the insect or the spider or whatever it is that's been parasitized so they're a bit like parasites in one sense and they're a bit like predators in another sense they kind of blur the boundary between parasites and predators hence the the sort of name parasitoid this is quite a big parasitoid wasp that you can see in this picture here Mostly, though, they're very small. In fact, the world's smallest insects are parasitoid wasps. So here, for example, is one of them. If you see this guy down here. Um, not very big, as you can see. You've got the eye of a cabbage white butterfly here for scale. And how this guy makes a living is hitches uh, a lift around the place on the leg or the body of cabbage white butterfly and lays its eggs in the eggs of cabbage white butterflies and uh, that's how it finds the eggs of cabbage white butterflies it just hitches a ride on cabbage white butterflies and there of course it's in the right place to parasitize their eggs so these are very tiny insects you wouldn't notice them in a garden you would never notice them and all the other species like them. All I would say about them is that they are very, very important in controlling the insects uh, and other animals that they parasitize in the garden. And certainly, although you never notice most of them, if they weren't there, you would soon notice them. So here's the first big question about wildlife gardening and um, I guess it's the biggest one really which is are good our gardens good for wildlife contrary to what people used to think and the answer is certainly uh, 
gardens are extremely good for wildlife. Gardens are exceptionally good for wildlife. Um, and the only reason people ever thought they weren't um, was that nobody had actually bothered to look. Um, that leads me on pretty quickly to another big question, I think, which is, does my garden have to be a mess? Because there's certainly a prevalent belief that a wildlife, the best wildlife gardens are some kind of uh, derelict wilderness um, like this one here. Now, there's nothing wrong with this garden. And in fact, this garden is probably OK for wildlife. There's probably quite a lot of wildlife just living in this Ford Anglia here. But your garden doesn't have to look like this to be good for wildlife. And again, we know that because of Jennifer Owen, because here's Jennifer Owen's um, house. It's a perfectly ordinary suburban um, detached house in, uh, in Leicester. Um, it's a perfectly tidy, ordinary house, and it's a perfectly tidy, ordinary garden. Um, not, not, a, not a wilderness, not derelict at all. And yet it contained that staggering diversity of, of wildlife. Another question that people often ask about wildlife gardening is, do I have in my garden, do I have to replicate some kind of wild or semi-natural habitat? Um, commonly, what, wildlife meadows. Um, but there are other things as well that people try to reproduce in their gardens. And it is, it is possible to reproduce semi-natural wild habitats in gardens, but it's actually very, very difficult and completely unnecessary. And again, we know that because of Jennifer Owen, because remember Jennifer Owen's garden was packed with wildlife. Um, we know that for certain. And she made no effort at all to create replicas of any kind of wild habitat in her garden. Her garden was simply a garden. It had, it had all the things you would expect in a normal suburban garden. Um, it had a lawn, this is part of it, it wasn't very big, um, had a lawn, it had um, veg plot, um, shrub borders, one or two trees, pond, um, all the usual things you would expect to find in a garden. Made no effort to replicate any, any kind of wild habitats like um, wildlife meadows and so on. These are not necessary um, for a garden to be attractive. To wildlife. So we can learn a great deal just from looking at the results of Jennifer Owen's uh, long-term study in her garden. There is a limit to what we can learn from Jennifer Owen's study though, because brilliant as it is, it is only one garden. And really we need to look at more than one garden if we're to answer quite a few of wildlife gardening's big questions. Which brings me to research project that I was involved in quite a few years ago now, which is um, Biodiversity in Urban Gardens in Sheffield, Bugs for short, project that I was involved in with the three other people on the list there at the University of Sheffield. Um, like many big projects, this produced shed loads of scientific papers, none of which I recommend you read. Um, if you want to know more about it, what I do recommend you read is the little book that I wrote um, after we'd finished the Bugs project, um, No Nettles Required, which describes the results of the project and a few other bits of research about wildlife gardening as well. Thing about the Bugs project is 
we looked at 61 different gardens in Sheffield, um, chosen really to be as different as possible. So they were either big or small or new or old um, in various places in the city. Um, so huge variety, there's just, there's just nine of them here, but there were 61 altogether. And because we had quite a large number of gardens, of course, we didn't manage to do any of them as thoroughly as Jennifer Owen did her garden. Um, didn't have the time. But by looking at lots of gardens, we were able to answer questions that you couldn't answer just by looking at one garden. And the first question we can answer right away is, do I need a big garden to be attractive to wildlife? Um, this is a big garden here. Actually, it's not all of a big garden. It's one corner of a very, very big garden. This is the Duke of Westminster's garden. He's one of Britain's richest men. So uh, he can afford to have a very big garden. Um, but that's not necessary. One of the things the Bugs Project demonstrated absolutely clearly was that there was no relationship at all between the wildlife value of a garden and its size. Garden size is completely irrelevant, uh, not important at all. Following on from the question about garden size, we can dispense with another gardening question now, which is, do I have to live in the suburbs? Do I have to have a suburban garden or is a city, city centre garden um, any good for wildlife? And again, the Bugs Project allowed us to answer that question pretty conclusively because we had gardens right throughout the city, right from the centre, right out to near the edge. And we found no effect of position in the city at all. It doesn't matter where your garden is in a city or in a town. Um, doesn't have to be in the suburbs, can be anywhere, and can still be very attractive to wildlife. So no, you don't need a big garden. You don't need a big garden, you don't need a suburban garden. Do I have to buy a lot of fancy gadgets? There are lots of people who make and sell fancy gadgets who would tell you you did, but again, the basic answer to that question is no. Um, there are things you can add to your garden that are of proven value for um, wildlife, such as obviously things like bird boxes, uh, bird feeders, and they are good for, they're good for birds and they work really well. But most of what's sold for invertebrates don't do anything at all. I can, this is a project I was involved in a few years ago um, for the Consumers Association testing these things. I can no longer remember after all these years what, what was meant to live in these boxes. Um, but it doesn't matter whether I can remember or not because they didn't work. Uh, so they are a complete waste of, waste of space, waste of money. Um, this is something we tried in the Bugs Project. This box is a bumblebee box and you can buy commercial bumblebee boxes but they're quite expensive so we had a limited budget so we made our own we made lots of um, bumblebee boxes according to the official design and uh, we put them out in suitable places in lots of gardens and they were completely useless none of them were used and that's what people normally find um, you can buy commercial ones. As I said, they're quite expensive. This is a commercial design used in a later trial, again, for Consumers Association that I was involved in. Uh, and none of these worked at all. Bumblebee boxes are a complete waste of space. Don't bother. What we did find, however, in various trials is that these things work. And these are nests nests or nest sites for solitary bees. Um, we have about 20 species of bumblebees in Britain, but we have more than 10 times as many species, about 250 species of solitary bees. Uh, 
And solitary bees lay their eggs in some kind of hole. And so these things here are, uh, you put them in your garden to provide nesting opportunities for solitary bees. And these things work very well. Um, all I would say is, even though they work very well, they're still probably not worth buying. Um, basically because it's easy to make your own and the ones you make are actually better than the ones you can buy. This is a homemade version. In fact, this is the design we used in the Bugs project. This is a commercial version and not only is this expensive, the problem with this is it's got a limited range of hole sizes and different size solitary bees use different size holes and so there's a there's a limit to the um, there's a limit to the kind of variety of bees that can use this whereas a wide variety of bees can use this design here because it's um, it's got holes of varying sizes it's just blind holes drilled into blocks of wood so anyone can make one of these and you can tell where they've been used because when the bees have finished laying their eggs they seal them up like so and generally they stay like that over the winter and then the following spring the young bees the young uh, the emerge tunnel their way out and you see a little hole appears like there and there and uh, all kinds of different species use them just one or two things about these things um, two things to bear in mind really one is that you should put these in a sunny spot if you can and also a sheltered spot so this is a nice place for one of these things it's faces south it's under an overhanging eave here so it's sheltered from the rain because they don't like being soaked all winter while they're pupating in these holes here um, as long as you do that i can almost guarantee well in fact i can in fact guarantee uh, that you will attract lots of customers to these uh, to these things so very easy to make work really well all i would say is that bees in gardens are pretty resourceful creatures and they might well use holes that you didn't actually intend so this is a hose reel in my garden and in fact this is a photo i took just the other day and there's a solitary bee decided to nest in this hole here which is one of the holes one of the screw holes holding the two halves of the casing of a um, hose reel together so they're, they're quite adaptable creatures solitary bees and they'll use almost any hole one thing to say one thing to add is that uh, the majority of solitary bees nest not in holes in uh, wood or in or in walls but in the ground and it's quite difficult actually in gardens to provide the kind of conditions that they really like so these kinds of solitary bees which are in fact the majority as i say tend not to be very common in gardens they prefer bare open dry sunny sandy sites um, what they really love is heathland and those kinds of conditions are quite hard to reproduce in gardens all i would say is if you do see them nesting in your garden and you might see something like this in a threadbare bit of lawn the only thing to remember is that's a solitary bee and leave it alone it's not doing any harm and uh, if you leave it the bees will use it and they will pupate in there and emerge and be very happy this is this is actually the characteristic volcano of a tawny mining bee in my garden uh, another of gardening 
Wildlife gardening is questions. Do I need to grow nettles? No, you don't. Um, I singled out nettles because um, if you if you pick up any wildlife gardening book or read any wildlife gardening um, newspaper or magazine article, you won't read very far before you find someone recommending that you grow nettles. And that's simply because there are a bunch of very attractive butterflies um, like small tortoiseshell and red admiral, comma, whose uh, caterpillars eat nettles. But it's a complete waste of time. The world has far more nettles than it needs without you growing any more. Um, we tested actually providing our own nettles um, in the bugs project and they didn't work. Um, Jennifer Owen had three patches of nettles in her garden um, and she kept an eye on them for the whole 30 years and they were never used by any butterfly. Um, so don't bother. Now a really big question, must I grow only native plants or mainly native plants? Now this again is something that you'll find recommended over and over again um, in various wildlife gardening uh, books, magazines, online websites, and so on. And it kind of seems obvious on the face of it that you should grow native plants if you're going to keep native herbivores happy. And of course, the basis, at the base of all the food chains in your garden is plants and the animals that eat those plants. And if more animals and more diverse communities of animals eat native plants, um, then presumably native plants are the best thing to grow. Now, I have to say, this is a difficult question to answer just by looking at real gardens. Um, in the Bugs Project, we didn't see any very obvious evidence that growing native plants was a good idea. But it's quite difficult to disentangle um, what's going on in real gardens. So full marks to the RHS for conducting this experiment a few years ago now, um, the, the RHS Plants for Bugs project. And what they did was um, they constructed a whole bunch of these things here, these little plots, which, which are like kind of little mini gardens really, lots of them. And each of these little mini gardens is planted up with a bunch of plants, um, which are in one of three categories. Um, natives, British natives. Um, a category that we call near natives, and near natives are plants that are not native to the British Isles, but are um, northern hemisphere plants from uh, Europe or North America or Asia quite closely related to um, natives so hence the name near native and then another bunch of plants another bunch of plots planted up entirely with what we call exotic plants and exotic plants are plants from the southern hemisphere very remote um, geographically and taxonomically from um, the native plants and the plants were matched so that they were the same kinds of plants so for example if the native plant is Eupatorium cannabinum here hemp agrimony the near nat native is Eupatorium purpureum the same genus from North America and the um, the exotic plant is Verbena bonariensis you get the idea same kinds of plants uh, here if the native is box the near native is Christmas box from Asia, same family. And the exotic is Pittosporum from New Zealand. All small evergreen shrubs. So you get the idea. The plants are matched. So they're kind of similar in size and nature, but they're very different kinds of plants in terms of whether they're native or related to natives. So earlier I showed you the experiment just when it was being set up. This is after a year or two when everything had grown and it's looking very luxuriant. 
lots of people here, including the leader of the project, the RHS's chief entomologist, Andy Salisbury, working on collecting and identifying the insects on these plots. Now, like a lot of big projects, generated a shed load of scientific papers, none of which, as usual, I recommend you read. Um, because all you need to know is that across the whole study, which looked at several different kinds of um, invertebrate wildlife, um, pollinators, insects and other animals that lived on the plants, insects and other animals that lived on the soil, across the whole study, natives supported more wildlife than near natives and the near natives in turn were better than exotics so basically kind of looks like good news if you're in favor of growing natives but and i have to say it's a very big but the effect of plant origin although it was significant, was small. There was not a big difference between the three different kinds of plants. And the effect of plant origin was completely dwarfed by the effect of plant quantity. Um, more plants, more flowers, more wildlife. And that was true across the board, whether the plants were native, near native or exotic, you grew more stuff basically in your garden, you had more, you had more wildlife. Um, and that was a much larger effect than the effect of plant origin. Also, to some extent, these different plant types were complementary. In other words, they provided different kinds of resources for wildlife. So for example, although um, natives tended to provide more flowers earlier in the year than exotics, the exotics tended to provide more flowers later in the year. Um, also, the exotics were more likely to be evergreen than the natives, and they provided, therefore, better shelter for overwintering insects. And therefore, um, one of the things you could say is that it's probably best to have a mixture of these different kinds of plants. And finally, the animals we call detritivores, these are the huge number of uh, animals that live on and in the soil and eat dead plants and in turn support a whole vast community of uh, predators and parasites. They don't care about plant origin at all. They, had, they don't, obviously, they're eating dead plants and they don't care whether dead plant came from when it was alive. Um, they don't care at all. So the take home message from the RHS Plants for Bugs project is that yes, there is a, there is a small advantage of growing natives, but it is very small. And in fact, you're better off growing a mixture of plants of different origins. Um, and in fact, it's just as well that that's what most gardeners in fact do. Most gardeners grow a mixture of natives, near natives and exotics. Not choosing that mixture particularly for that reason, but just naturally because that's what people tend to grow. Um, people grow what they like, obviously. The big question, I guess, um, 
one of the one of the biggest questions what's the single best thing the single most important thing i can do for garden wildlife um, many people faced with that question i think would suggest that it might be a pond and certainly digging a pond in your garden if you don't have one is one of the most important one of the best things you can do for garden wildlife um, and of course like this pond here it can be it can be an extremely um, extremely nice garden feature um, in its own right it can be very attractive um, a garden pond will of course provide a habitat for a whole bunch of wildlife that won't live in your garden at all unless you have a pond quite apart from that a lot of animals live in ponds as larvae and then go on to um, live in the rest of the garden as mature insects lots of flies for example uh, damselflies dragonflies and so ponds contribute to the biodiversity of the garden as a whole um, so ponds are very nice ponds are very important if you've room for a pond if you want a pond um, go ahead certainly it needn't be big even tiny ponds are very good but i would say actually that a pond is not necessarily the single best thing you can do for wildlife um, i would say well let me let me show you let me show you these four gardens here um, these these are four gardens from the sheffield bugs project and these um, these gardens were not particularly good for wildlife and i will i will i won't leave you for very long in suspense to figure out why they're not very good for wildlife other than to point out that if a garden looks a bit two-dimensional and a bit a bit boring basically to you it probably also looks pretty two-dimensional and boring to your local wildlife and so it's maybe not surprising that these were four of the least interesting gardens um, in terms of quantity and diversity of wildlife in the Sheffield Bugs project. Um, on the other hand, here's a garden, also one of the Sheffield Bugs gardens, that turned out to be very good for wildlife. And I won't, you know, I won't ask you, I won't insult by your intelligence by trying to guess what the difference is between this garden and those other four gardens. The difference is obvious. And it's it's the same the same conclusion that emerged from the Sheffield Bugs project that looked at 61 different gardens, and the same result that emerged from the RHS Plants for Bugs project, which is that basically the more vegetation there is in your garden, the more wildlife. And the reason for that. There's nothing very surprising about that. The reason for that is very simple. Um, the all this stuff, all these um, all these shrubs, trees, hedges, big herbaceous plants here, they are all two things. They are habitat. They are places for animals to live. And secondly, they are food. All that green stuff is supporting lots of herbivores while it's alive. When it dies and falls to the ground and decays, supporting an equally large number of detritivores, of animals um, that eat dead plant material. And the more of that stuff there is, either dead or alive, the more habitat there is, and the more food there is. 
And that translates into more diversity right up the food chain through the predators, through the parasitoids, through all the predatory beetles, through the spiders, through the birds, the hedgehogs, um, the frogs, other amphibians, and all the rest. So basically, that's the single, the single most important thing you can do for wildlife in your garden. And the good thing about this is it's a lot simpler than telling people to dig a pond, is to simply, if you don't have one, is to plant a tree, essentially. And if you have a tree, plant another one. And if you only have a tiny garden, then plant a small tree. But whatever you do, plant a tree. If you've any choice in the matter and you're deciding whether your garden should have a fence or a hedge, choose a hedge. A hedge is great for wildlife. A fence is useless for wildlife. If you have a fence already, cover it with climbers. Basically, turn it into a hedge. The more the more green stuff in your garden, the more wildlife you will have. And actually, the basic wildlife gardening message um, is as simple as that. That's almost all you, all you need to know. So that's, that's basically it. Thank you, folks. Okay. Thanks, Ken. That was great. Um, some really interesting topics covered, especially the non-native native debate. I always find that a really, really interesting one. Mm. Um, so we've had some questions come in, so um, I shall fire away. Um, we have a question from Naomi. Are there any plants that don't support wildlife at all? Um... Depends what you mean by support. Uh, not really, no, no. There, re there aren't any plants that don't support wildlife at all. Obviously, obviously, if you grow plants that are very, very distant in terms of their evolutionary origins from anything in the native flora, there's going to be very little um in the garden that will actually eat the living leaves of that plant so so say um eucalyptus say you grow eucalyptus eucalyptus is in a is in a family that's largely southern hemisphere the only place you can find eucalyptus is australia um Probably nothing in your garden will eat eucalyptus while it's actually growing. But, but a eucalyptus tree um, provides a lot of dead plant material when its leaves fall. I know it's evergreen, but even evergreen leaves fall. And as I said, dead plant material is consumed by all the usual animals, millipedes, wood lice, springtails, worms, slugs, all the rest, just like native plants. And they go on to feed another enormous food chain. Plus the tree itself is good for birds um, to nest in, just to roost in, um, place to hang a bird feeder. Um, eucalyptus flowers are good for pollinators. Bees love eucalyptus flowers they don't care that they're australian so even a plant like eucalyptus where people would say well eucalyptus is useless for, for british wildlife in one sense it is there'll be nothing eating the leaves or probably nothing very little but there's a whole bunch of other once you look more deeply into it there's a whole bunch of other um of other uses of even a plant like, like eucalyptus so so it's not it's not really you know, it's not true to say there are plants that are completely useless. That's great. Thank you. It's good to know. Um, 
Another question is a question we often get asked and that is what is the best slash most natural way to control pest populations within your garden? Oh, well, <laughs> you know, that's almost a whole talk on, it, on its own, isn't it? <laughs> um, firstly, Firstly, I would say, is it really a pest? I mean, there's a great quote from Jennifer Owen, actually. Uh, after she'd spent 30 years studying the wildlife in her garden, she said, um, there were no pests in my garden. Everything in my garden was a source of um, fascination and interest. And... I didn't call any of it a pest. I just loved it all. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I would say the best thing to do in the end is to leave it alone. Because any attempt to interfere with um, any attempt to interfere with the normal ecological process in the garden, likely to have effects that you did not expect to have, frankly. So I have, a, I have an annual argument with, with my wife about, about the aphids that infest our Philadelphus shrub. We have a lovely Philadelphus, you know, Belle Etoile, with those gorgeous white smelly flowers. Yeah. And every year it seems to attract a lot of aphids. Uh, and she's itching to get in there and start killing them. And I say, look, just, just hold on. Just leave it alone. And it's amazing. You almost wonder where they come from because uh, quite quickly, it's colonized by ladybirds. And these ladybirds are at it like knives. And then a week later, the, the, the Philadelphia is covered with ladybird larvae. And they can't believe their luck. They're dashing about, scoffing these aphids like there's no tomorrow. And when you look more closely, there are hoverfly larvae there as well, which are less obvious than ladybird larvae. But when you look for them, they're there also, also hoovering up the aphids. And frankly, there was tons of aphids on my Philadelphus like a month ago. And I go out there now, it's covered in pupated ladybirds <laughs> yeah yeah they're all covered, full up <laughs> covered in ladybird pupae and i can't find a single aphid they've eaten them all so i would say the natural processes in your garden they may work a little slower than you would like but frankly if you're that impatient you're probably not cut out to be a wildlife gardener at all and perhaps not even a gardener frankly so that's my mm. advice. Leave it alone. <laughs> okay, great stuff. We have another question from Phil. Um, where can I get the best pond plants or wildlife? Should they be native? Well, no, not really. Um, from a from a from a wildlife perspective, the um the ponds the, the 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 pond the plants in your pond are are doing two big jobs one is they're providing oxygen and they're providing shelter for insects and tadpoles and whatever to hide in and any plant will do that whether it's native or alien and most of the wildlife in your garden most of the wildlife in your pond that's eating plant material is eating dead plant material. So the usual story doesn't care whether that plant material was native or alien. So from a purely wildlife perspective, it doesn't really matter whether the pond, the plants you, you put in your pond are, are native or alien. Now, having said that, there are a handful of alien plants that are sometimes planted in gardens that do have a very bad name for being invasive 
in the wider countryside. Yep, and we all know that we all know what these plants are, you know. And so much so, in fact, that some of these are now illegal. Some of these are now actually banned. You you literally cannot buy them. Um, all I would say is, yes, yeah, some of these plants are extremely bad if they get into watercourses and canals and so on. But frankly, in a garden pond, they're not going to do a great deal of harm if that's where they stay. And the reason they've been a problem is people have thrown them out carelessly, recklessly into natural habitats where, and they shouldn't have done that. But if you keep these plants in your garden, in your pond, that's where they will stay. And in fact, they're probably relatively harmless as long as you make sure that's where they stay. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be too fussed about growing alien plants. And the, the most troublesome invasive alien pond plants are now, have now been legislated against, frankly. So you're not in danger of buying them because no one's allowed to sell them. We do have another pond related question as well. Um, should I remove green algae from my pond? There is a lot of life in the pond, including snails. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think if you, it's, it's hard if your pond is just literally choked with algae, with filamentous green algae like spirogyra and things like that. It's quite hard to resist the temptation to hoik it out because it just looks like green soup. And frankly, you know, a pond does have a kind of aesthetic dimension and, <laughs> and you just don't want to look at that every day because it's horrible. Um, but what you should try to do is arrange your pond in a way that that doesn't happen. So if that's happening, there's probably too many resources in your pond, too much light, too many nutrients. So try to make sure there are no excess nutrients getting into your pond from any source and try to keep quite a proportion of the area of your pond covered. So get yourself a nice big water lily, which will keep most of the surface of your pond dark because the algae won't grow underneath water lily leaves because there's no light. So I would, I would go naturally for, um, I would go and try and control the algae naturally. But I, I have to say, if you have a problem with it, it is tempting to pull it out. But always leave it on the side of the pond for a day to let everything escape back into the pond first. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Phil. What trees are best to plant? This is really, this is really a kind of size question, I think, because the best tree to plant is one that's in scale with your garden. So if you have a big garden, if you're lucky to have a really big garden, grow a really big tree, grow more than one really big tree. Um, if you only have a small garden, grow a really small tree. Um, but if you can only plant one tree, I have to say, probably to get the maximum value, either a native tree or a native relative tree so say a hawthorn would be very good but it doesn't necessarily have to be the native wild hawthorn 
there are lots of ornamental hawthorns, different species, sometimes hybridized with native hawthorns, which will frankly provide just about the same value for wildlife as a native one. Um, or rowan's the same, another rowan and small tree, brilliant small tree for a garden. You could grow a native rowan, you could grow a Chinese rowan. 99% of the rowan eating insects in your garden won't know the difference. The insects won't be able to tell the flowers apart. The birds won't be able to tell the berries apart. And everything that eats the dead leaves won't be able to tell them apart. So it really doesn't matter. Amazing, thank you. Um, this is gonna have to be our final question, but it's quite a nice one to finish on. Um, what is your favorite insect? Oh dear. <laughs> well, you saw how many insects <laughs> you saw how many insects we think Jennifer Owen had in her garden, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, and every garden's the same, frankly. If you've got a reasonably wildlife friendly garden, you've probably all got 10,000 species of insect in your garden. And therefore, picking your favourite, frankly. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I see, I'll tell you what I see quite often in my garden. Uh, and I'm just blown away every time I see it by how by how beautiful it is, actually. And that's the rose chafer. Yeah. Rose chafer beetle. Yeah, yeah. It's one of my favourite beetles. I see, I see that. I see that in my garden, you know, every week or two. I see one just bumbling about. And they're so kind of, yes. And they're <laughs> so... Ashamed. Yeah, they're so kind of... Not only are they very beautiful, they're so kind of stupid, you know? They're just tottering <laughs> about like they don't know where they're going or what they're doing or where their next meal's coming from. And uh, I just love them, you know? I love watching them fumbling around. And Yeah, I, yeah. so yeah, Rose Chafer, that's my... And, and you had a picture, so it's your favourite. <laughs> it is, it is. Marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you so much, Ken. Um, and thank you, everyone who came to the talk this evening. Um, we'll also be posting out a link to our YouTube channel. We'll be putting up this webinar on there if you'd like to view it later or if you'd like to send it to anyone else who might be interested. Um, if this has inspired you anyway to make your garden more wildlife friendly, then do reply to our email. We'll be sending out a follow up email after the webinar. Right. Right. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>